Hey guys, welcome back to the channel for part 2 of my review of the ASCAR 151PHQ. In part 1, I did an unboxing of this beautiful new telescope and I shared my first impressions. If you missed it, I'll put the link to it right here. In this video, we're going to conduct a series of optical tests and I hope that it will help you decide whether this telescope is right for you. And even if the 151PHQ is too big for your needs, a lot of the conclusions in this video will be applicable to the smaller refractors in the PHQ series because they all share the same optical design. If you would like to purchase this telescope or its reducer or really anything from a Gina Astro and would like to support this channel at the same time, feel free to use one of the affiliate links that I put in the description below. This video is going to be a bit technical but I hope that you'll find it interesting and towards the end, I will reveal whether or not I decided to purchase this telescope or return it to a Gina Astro. All right, let's get started. First, a quick disclaimer. I don't pretend to be an expert in optical testing. I have limited equipment, knowledge and time, and the tests I am going to talk about in this video represent the best I was able to achieve while I had this telescope on loan from a Gina Astro. Also, this is just a sample of one. If you want to contribute to the discussion, please leave a comment below. I will also put a link to the Cloudy Nights thread that talks about this telescope in the description of this video. Whenever I test a new telescope, I always start with a quick collimation check. On a refractor, this can be done with a cheap Cheshire eyepiece. This test won't tell you whether your telescope is perfectly collimated, but it will allow you to spot an obvious misalignment early in the testing process, which can save you a ton of time and frustration. In my case, the reflections of the silver plate of the Cheshire eyepiece against all of the optical surfaces were concentric and merged into one, which means that the objective lens is properly collimated and the focuser is aligned with the optical axis. We'll come back to the topic of collimation a little later in this video. Call me old-fashioned, but every time I get a new telescope, I never stick a camera to it until I've had a chance to look through it with my own eyes because a visual test can quickly reveal a lot of information about the quality of an optical instrument if you know what to look for. And the first test that I like to do is a star test. So I first pointed the telescope at a bright star and I centered it in the field of view of my Teleview Nagler 9mm eyepiece. I could easily detect hints of false color when the star was ever so slightly out of focus, which is expected with a refractor. However, once I had precisely focused the image, I could no longer see any spurious color. A similar test with my Astrotech AT130 EDT triplet refractor shows some amount of false color, specifically a purple halo, even at focus. This result seems to indicate that the ASCAR 151PHQ has significantly better color correction than my Astrotech refractor. And we will attempt to confirm this later in this video when we quantify the amount of longitudinal chromatic aberration. I then turned to the third quarter moon and I found the image very pleasing, even when using my Teleview Nagler 3.5mm eyepiece, which gives a 300x magnification with this telescope. Most importantly, I noticed that the lunar limb, or the edge between the illuminated and the dark areas of the lunar landscape, were razor sharp and the dark areas appeared pitch black. This is usually a sign that the optical system does not have any major aberration, that the optical surfaces are fairly smooth, that the coatings are good and that the baffling does its job. Finally, I slewed the telescope to Jupiter. This is a demanding target because the surface features on that planet have a fairly low contrast. Again, the image looked quite good and I was able to glimpse a few details within the equatorial bands during fleeting moments of better seeing. But I thought that the contrast was not as high as I had experienced it before on this target with other premium refractors. I remember looking at Jupiter through a Takahashi TSA-120 a year ago, 
and the contrast was superior in the Takahashi. The colors also appeared more saturated. Maybe the conditions were better that day? I don't know. Visual testing can be quite subjective, unless you compare views between two telescopes set up side by side, which unfortunately I don't have the luxury to do. So, what does this all mean? Remember that the ASCAR 151PHQ was designed and is marketed as an astrograph. As such, it is clear that even though it is quite good, it is likely not going to be the best telescope on the market for visual observing. If you are a pure visual observer and a very discerning one, and you want to stick with a refractor, you may want to consider a slightly smaller telescope that is better suited to visual observing. Maybe a fluorite doublet from Takahashi like the FC100 could be a good option? I don't know. There are a few options to choose from, and you can find a lot of good advice on the Cloud Unites forum. Nevertheless, I was pleasantly surprised with the visual performance of the ASCAR 151PHQ. It produced spectacular images, and you will not be disappointed with it. I devised a unique system to quantify, in absolute terms, the amount of longitudinal chromatic aberration in a refractor. Let me show you how it works. The first step is to capture the 2D spectrum of a star of spectral type A, F, or G across the entire visible spectrum using a spectrograph. I used my 3D printed Starx spectrograph in its low resolution configuration. If you're curious about this instrument, I did a video series on it, which I published to my YouTube channel, and I recommend you check it out. And here is what the low resolution 2D spectrum of star Theta Leo looks like across the entire visible spectrum when captured using my AstroTech AT130 EDT triplet ED refractor. If we stretch the image in PixInsight, we can see the fishtail effect caused by the longitudinal chromatic aberration in the blue and near UV parts of the spectrum. We can also calibrate this 2D spectrum in wavelength, either using well-known absorption lines visible in the 2D spectrum, such as those from the Balmer series, or preferably using a calibration lamp, neon in this case. Once we have done that, we can run the 2D spectrum of our star through a Python script I created and that you can find as an interactive Python notebook in the GitHub repository at the URL below. The script reads the FITS file that comes out of the camera and measures the thickness of the 2D spectrum across the entire range of wavelengths and draws this graph. It can also compute a score between 0 and 1. The higher the value, the lower the longitudinal chromatic aberration. That score basically represents how wavy the graph is in the 400 to 700 nanometer range. In this example, we can see that the Ricci Chrétien telescope has a very flat graph and a score very close to 1.0. It won't be exactly 1.0 because the spectrograph itself has optical elements which have aberrations. So 0.9 is roughly our upper limit. Now let's run this script on the 2D spectrum obtained with my AstroTech AT130 EDT. As you can see, the graph we obtain is rather wavy and the score is 0.57. If we restrict the scoring to the range 420-680 nanometers, which is the band pass of the Astronomic L3 UV IR cut filter I use, the score becomes 0.60, which is slightly better, and it demonstrates why UV IR cut filters are so important for refractor owners. Now let's see the 2D spectrum of a star of the same spectral type as Theta Leo, but captured with the ASCAR 151PHQ. Again, we'll stretch the image to see it a little bit better. The fishtail looks a lot narrower than with the AstroTech refractor. Let's put them side by side so that we can compare. Indeed, the spectrum feels a lot tighter with the ASCAR 151PHQ. Actually, it is so narrow that we can even see the fishtail coming from the second diffraction order right here. Since the stellar spectrum is a lot narrower, we can expect a higher score for the ASCAR, so let's run our script again. And indeed, the ASCAR 151PHQ gets a score of 0.64. Again, if we restrict the scoring to the range 420-680 nanometers, we get 0.68, which is very nice. So overall, the longitudinal chromatic aberration of the ASCAR 151PHQ 
is significantly lower than that of the AstroTech AT130 EDT. And that confirms the level of color correction I noted during the visual test. Unfortunately, I do not have access to other premium refractors, but I expect that the most premium optics in the world would have a score slightly higher, probably around 0.70. I was able to find a 2D spectrum obtained by a French amateur astronomer using a Takahashi FSQ85ED. Unfortunately, I do not have access to the raw FITS file, so I could not plug that into my script. But qualitatively, you can see that even the most expensive refractors in the world are not perfect when it comes to color correction. And the ASCAR 151PHQ does quite well, especially for its price point. Wavefront analysis is a technique that allows us to identify and quantify the aberrations in an optical system, and it can yield several well-known image quality metrics, such as the PV or RMS wavefront error, or the famous Strel ratio. In the lab, wavefront analysis is done with a laser interferometer, but it is also possible to do it using two images of a defocused star and some specialized software to analyze these two images and reconstruct the wavefront air. Let me show you how I did it. I captured these two out-of-focus images of a star that was relatively bright and placed high up in the night sky one morning. The seeing was excellent and the telescope had cooled all night. And these are 20 second exposures, so any rapid change caused by the seeing should have been averaged out. Also, I used my Antlia green filter, which has a bandpass centered around 530 nanometers. This is important because image quality metrics are wavelength dependent, and they are meaningless if you don't specify the wavelength that was used to make the measurement. By the way, these two images confirm that the telescope is indeed well collimated. As you can see, the diffraction rings are perfectly concentric. You probably noticed that these two images are slightly different. That is normal and expected in an apochromatic refractor. Roland Christen, a renowned optical designer and the founder of the astrophysics brand of premium refractors, wrote about that and confirmed that it is perfectly normal. Here is a link to his notes on the topic. After loading these two images in the wavefront analysis software, it is able to mathematically reconstruct the wavefront error as well as a Ronchi and Foucault diagram. In this test, the software calculated a maximum PV error of lambda over 6, an RMS error of lambda over 36, and a Strel ratio of 0.97, which is excellent. I spent a good amount of time reading the forums to learn more about this wavefront analysis technique, and it is important to take these results with a grain of salt. I would not make a purchasing decision of that size purely based on these numbers. However, as a data point among many others, it can be a useful tool. In this case, a Strel ratio in the neighborhood of 0.97 is really excellent. Actually, it is quite extraordinary for a mass-produced telescope. The first imaging test I was able to perform was done using my ZW ASI 533mm Pro camera at the native f7 focal ratio. I took a few shots of some random part of the night sky and Nina measured a star HFR in the neighborhood of 1.8 pixels, which is just about the sharpest image I was ever able to capture over the last three years with my Astrotech refractor. Except that the ASCAR has a 15% longer focal length and I was focusing manually, I had not yet installed an electronic focuser. So this is quite extraordinary, and it means that the ASCAR is capable of producing very sharp images with pinpoint stars on a small sensor. What about large sensors, though? After all, ASCAR claims a 60mm image circle, so it should be able to accommodate a full-frame camera. I was able to borrow a Nikon D750 full-frame DSLR, from a local Bay Area amateur astronomer, and we took a few images with and without the reducer. Let's take a look at the results. Here is the first image we took with the Nikon DSLR. This is a raw 10 second sub that's been debared and then stretched using the screen transfer function in PixInsight. It is a small star cluster in the constellation Cassiopeia. The first thing that probably jumps out is the amount of vignetting. This is not caused by the telescope. 
we used a T adapter with M48 threads because that's all we had. But for a full frame camera, you should really use a larger T adapter. Ascar makes T rings with M54 threads for both Canon and Nikon. And that would have eliminated pretty much all of the vignetting you can see here. All right, let's inspect this image more closely. We'll start at the center where the stars are perfectly round as you would expect. Now let's look in the corners. The stars are also perfectly round and the lateral chromatic aberration is pretty much non-existent. I also confirmed using ASTAP that the star HFR is very uniform across the entire field of view. This means that this telescope is able to handle a full frame sensor at its native F7 without any problem. Now what about using this telescope with its dedicated 0.7x reducer? Ascar claims that the system still retains a full frame image circle. Let's check it out. Here is a 10 second image of the same target as before taken with the Nikon D750 but this time at f4.9 using the Ascar 0.7x reducer. We respected the suggested 55mm back focus. Again, don't worry about the vignetting, it is caused by the T adapter we used. Let's zoom in on the center of the image. Again, the stars are perfectly round as you would expect. Now let's take a look at the corners. Well, it's not too bad. We can see a small amount of lateral chromatic aberration, but it does not look horrible. The stars are radially elongated even when inspecting each color channel independently, which means that there is a small amount of field curvature as well. We can see the same effect in the top left corner of the image. Now let's go to the center left part of the frame where the aberrations cause the brighter stars to have this blocky shape. This test seems to confirm what other reviewers have noted, which is that the refractors in the PHQ series coupled with this reducer cannot achieve a sufficiently large aberration free field of view to accommodate a full frame camera. An APS-C sensor will have absolutely no problem, but a full frame camera will show some minor defect around the periphery of the image and you will need to crop. Now it is important to state that other reviewers have noticed that using a slightly greater backspacing, for example 60 mm instead of 55, can make the stars appear rounder around the edges of the frame. However, by doing so, you may be compromising the sharpness of the stars in the center. So I suggest that you experiment. And for that, I recommend Ascar's new back focus adjuster. I'll put a link to that product in the description of this video. If you give it a try, let us know your findings in the comments below. Let me conclude by summarizing what I think about this telescope. At $4,400 US dollars, I think that the new Ascar 151 PHQ is an incredible value. This is a very well designed and a very well made telescope. It excels at astrophotography and it can also give very pleasing results when used visually. Still, there are a few things that Ascar may want to improve. The first one is the dew shield locking system, which I talked about in my last video. The second one is the carrying case, which is too narrow to store the telescope with a ZW EAF attached to it. By making the case 20 or 25 mm wider, or by changing the layout of the enclosed high density foam, it could accommodate a ZW EAF without having to remove it every time you want to store the telescope in its case. And finally, Ascar may want to update its marketing material and stop claiming that its 0.7x reducer retains a full frame image circle because that just isn't true in reality. Since this telescope tested so well, I decided to purchase it from Agena Astro. If you decide to purchase this telescope as well or anything else from Agena Astro, I encourage you to use one of the affiliate links I put in the description below as a way to support this channel. All right, I wanted to thank all of you for tuning in to my channel. I have recently received very positive comments on my videos and your encouragement means a lot to me. Also, it takes quite a long time to put together a video like this one. So I hope that you enjoy this kind of content. If you do, please give this video a like and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I'll be back in a few weeks. So until next time, thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.